Okay, uh, awesome, we are online. Uh, welcome everyone to the class. Um, here is a couple of things um, we are going to do today and then to the rest, uh, to the rest of the quarter. So uh, the plan will be that today I will be talking about um, uh, evolution of, uh, of networks and how do you think about dynamic uh, networks and how do we model that. Then uh, next week we will also have one more kind of a more traditional network science topic. Um, then I think uh, on Thursday is the, is the exam, if I remember correctly, right? Tuesday, okay, great. So then the exam is on Tuesday, next week. Okay, great, so exam is on Tuesday next week. Thursday next week we'll do the one more uh, kind of um, the classical network science topic, most likely about robustness uh, of these networks and so on. And then for the last three lectures, we will kind of move, uh, move towards the, the representation learning on graphs and deep learning as well. And we'll have uh, a series of three lectures on knowledge graphs, applications, and some theoretical properties of graph neural networks. Um, and those lectures will be basically given by the postdocs and students in my group or prepared by them because that's kind of latest, greatest there is um, in this area. So I think it will be super exciting. So that's essentially um, the plan for the next two weeks. And then it's end of quarter and kind of Merry Christmas and all that good stuff. All right, so that's the idea. So what are we going to talk about today is we'll talk about um, evolving networks, right? Networks that change their structure over time. Um, and uh, essentially, almost all the real world network evolved by basically adding and removing links and edges over time. And there's many examples like this in social networks, right? We make new friends and we kind of uh, lose touch with the old friends. Uh, people people uh, come into the network, people leave the network. Uh, you can also think of the internet, web graphs, emails, phone calls, uh, any kinds of communication networks as networks that evolve over time. And one way to study them is to create these types of snapshots and look at the network structure uh, over time. Um, there are many other examples. For example, these, these are, this is an example of a collaboration network in a class like ours, uh, you know, after homework one. Um, uh, homeworks uh, one and two, and then after the class project, right? And again, you see kind of visually in this case that this network is getting uh, more, more connected. Here, uh, nodes are students and edges between the nodes uh, exist if uh, there is a reported collaboration, right? So given our collaboration policy, we could actually map out this network for this class. It would have around, I think, 300, 350 nodes, and then some number of connections, okay? Um, and there is many other examples of where, where you look at evolution of networks. Where evolution of networks are very interesting is especially if you think about this with diffusion of information and diffusion of certain practices. For example, in this case, you can look at evolution of industries over time where um, every dot is a different company. Um, companies can be of uh, different, um, different types. Um, and uh, you can uh, now study how kind of collaborations and business relationships between companies are um, evolving over time. This is just examples of these types of networks. Um, and uh, then, right, like you can take this uh, data that I had on the previous slide, but you can even further separate it out, let's say, in different uh, industrial um, uh, 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 sectors. And then you can plot or try to analyze these networks uh, over time where again, edges mean alliances. And you see how for, through, for certain industries, they kind of go from, through very different patterns in some alliances form and, and get disbanded. In others, these alliances seems to persist. Um, in, you know, in, for example, up here, you see that there seems to be this kind of big alliance where everyone's a member of, and then there is the periphery. And then kind of over time, the biggest alliance kind of uh, breaks down, but there's a lot of kind of small alliances. Similar seems to be happening here, but then, but then this alliance network totally shatters. Uh, while, for example, I know in medical supplies, again, different patterns are observable, right? And these are, these are right now very interesting and nice visualizations that give us a lot of ideas of what might be going on and how could we capture and characterize that behavior. Um, this is collaboration structure of, um, of, academic, uh, of academic institutions. Um, and uh, the community structure is indicated by the color. So basically, the who's strongly collaborating uh, with whom. 
Um, and again, there is a, a, a temporal component between uh, these networks uh, over time. Yet another example of an evolving network, and I have uh, the last one. This is, uh, um, uh, these are the components of the Apple's inventor network over a six year period. So basically, uh, uh, ties here um, uh, correspond to people co-writing a patent together. And these are, let's say, all the people from Apple who have published uh, patents. And uh, this is the temporal component. And you can see how the network is growing, getting bigger, um, right? And the size of the node measures their total number of collaborations or patents they have, uh, 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 they have produced, and then uh, li uh, colors mean different uh, technology areas or classes. And again, there is very interesting here. The, cl the, cluster the, the colors seems to be very clustered. But as time goes on, you can see that these colors are less clustered. So it means that these patterns, these collaborations, seem to be more interdisciplinary, at least at the Apple company as the time goes on. And you know, Apple is interesting because you know, this was probably the best, the best time for Apple, and Steve Jobs was around, and, and good stuff like that. Right? So just more, more examples of how can you think about evolving networks. So now what are we going to do in this class today? We are going to talk about ways to study evolving networks at several different levels. We'll talk about how um, networks evolve at the global macroscopic level. We will talk about how networks evolve at the, uh, this kind of intermediate scale of resolution. We will talk about how network motifs can capture evolution of networks. Uh, and then we'll also talk about how networks can evolve uh, at the level of node properties. And the way we'll do the lecture, we'll first do number one. Then we'll do number three, and then we'll do number two. Okay. Um, so the way you can think about it at, the, at number one is like, how does the entire network structure, the property of it, how does it evolve over time? At uh, number two, you are asking, how are these network motifs, little substructures, how are they being created, uh, and how they appear over time? And then here at the bottom level, you can be basically asking, how does the importance of the node in the network change? as the network structure is evolving, right? So that's a node level question. That's a question for groups of nodes. And the top is question for all the nodes in the network, right? So that's how we want to um, think of this, right? So as I said, mi um, at microscopic, we are asking about individual nodes. At mesoscopic, we ask about groups of nodes. And at ma macroscopic, we'll be asking something about the property of the entire network. So um, what I want to uh, show you first is this notion of macroscopic evolution of networks. Um, and uh, uh, this was uh, very fascinating. So actually, this was, this was my first paper I published as a PhD student. Um, this was in 2004. Um, and I'll show you why basically my first uh, project as a student. OK? So uh, here was the idea. Um, the question was, how do networks evolve at this global level? Right? What are some global phenomena of network growth? Um, and uh, the way you could think of this is to ask, basically, how are statistics of the network change over time? Um, and I asked myself um, two very simple questions at that point in time. I asked, you know, what is the relation between the number of nodes and the number of edges over time? Like something super basic, right? And then the second one was, how does the diameter of the network change as the network uh, grows, right? Um, and then, uh, kind of as a follow-up, we also ask, how does the evolution of the degree distribution, how is that, right? How does the degree distribution of the network change over time? OK? So these are, let's say, the three questions. And the, the, they are very empirical. But the question is, what does, is, does this persist over different classes of network? And can I think of whatever we will discover as some kind of universal laws of how networks evolve. That's kind of the goal. The goal is almost like, can we do some kind of physics of networks? What are the basic laws? So here is one question, right? So if you say, at some given point in time t, I have n nodes, and I have uh, e edges. Now imagine that, I don't know, at the next time point, or sometime in the future, the number of nodes will double. The question is, what will happen to the number of edges, right? So what's the number of edges when the number of nodes doubles? Or you know, whatever, number of nodes grows by 10%, does the number of edges also grow by 10%, right? Um, do you have any, any thoughts? Do you think it will be less? Do you think it will be more? I mean, if it's going to be the, like a very similar to 
what you have, and then the full copy of the network will be double, and then edges across the gap will be more than double. Okay, interesting. Okay, great. So you think it will be more than double? Okay. What do others think? Same reason. Oh, okay, good, good. It could be less, right? Like because this would mean as network gets bigger, everyone gets more and more edges. So we'll just be swamped in edges, right? So maybe it is actually less than two times. The other option is if you have a process that grows and every node creates k edges, then why shouldn't it be just times two, right? If nothing changed, the, pro the, the thing is just growing, uh, nodes are added, each node creates a certain number of links, they should be able to maintain that number of links. So you know, it should be two times two. If the number of people grows, the number of uh, connection grows, right? And I would actually argue that it's not clear why the number of connections should grow faster than the number of people, right? If there is, I don't know, 10 billion people on the earth, does this mean that we'll have more friends? It's not clear that that means we'll have more friends, right? So it's a good question. So the question is what happens? Uh, and you are in some sense right because it more than doubles, it turns out. Um, and it doesn't just like kind of more than double and that's it, but it follows a very specific uh, relationship, something that is called densification power law. So let me explain how this is, uh, how, how you can now do this, right? So the question is, what is the relation between the number of nodes and number of edges over time? And the first guess, and what was in the literature at that time was that, was this hypothesis of average, um, a constant average degree over time, right? So basically, every person has 10 friends. So if number of people doubles, the number of edges double, but you know, the average degree remains constant over time. Um, as I said, this is not what you see in empirical data. If you take different networks, for example, the network of routers on the internet or the citation networks, and every dot is a network at a, at a different point in time, Every network has a number of nodes on the x-axis and number of edges on the y-axis. And uh, if you plot this now on logarithmic scales, it will look like a line. And if you fit a stra straight line to it, you will have a slope that is non-trivial, like 1.1 or 1.6. Okay? So what does this mean? This means that the number of edges at a given time is proportional to the number of nodes at that given time raised to this exponent a. And if the relationship would be linear, then the exponent a should be equal to 1. Okay? And then if you think about it more, the exponent a can be only between 1 and 2. Right? 1 means, or, uh, one means you maintain the degree. Less than 1 would mean the average degree is decreasing over time. Uh, and 2 is the most you can do. The reason why 2 is the most you can do, because this means the number of edges grows quadratically with the number of nodes. And that's how quickly the adjacency matrix grows. Right? You cannot increase the number of nodes cubically, because the number of possible edges only, only increases quadratically, because of the adjacency matrix size. Right? So this, is means, this means that A will be, let's say, between 0, z let's say zero and, uh, and 2. It turns out that it's 1.6, 1.2. So it's bigger than 1. So it means that edges at a given time is node raised to some power a, and that power is non-trivial, and it's bigger than 1. So it means the number of edges is growing faster than the number of nodes, which means that the um, average degree in this network is growing over time. Um, and um, it uh, also, also, and that's why it's called the densification power law, because the network is getting denser. There is more and more connections in there. So that's the first empirical observation. And I could show you a list of many other networks uh, where this holds. So there is, uh, there is the following thing, right? Like basically the observation is that the number of edges grows faster than the number of nodes, or that average degree is increasing over time. The relationship is the following equation, so nodes raised to the power alpha, uh, power a is the number of edges. Or another way you could say is that log number of edges divided by log number of nodes is a constant, right? If I take logs on both ends and divide, I get that. Yes? So when you talk about the number of nodes growing over time, especially in like observational data, are you assuming that if a node is there at time t, it's going to be there at time t plus 1? Or could it be different nodes coming in and other nodes going out? A great question. So actually, it's both. Right? So, so in a citation network, citation networks only grow. All kind of old papers don't die. 
in the network of internet, you, servers come and go. Okay. So what we actually did in the, that's an excellent question you're actually asking. So here, these are not, the, this is not time, but this is size, right? So we took all the snapshots of the graph of autonomous systems, so basically of the internet topology, and sorted them by size. And now this is size versus edges, and here is really time versus edges, because this is just kind of growing over time. And I think these are monthly snapshots of a archive citation network uh, from the beginning of archive till, till some time, right? So uh, excellent point. So basically the answer is both, all right? Uh, great, thank you for that. Um, as I said, A is this densification exponent. It will be less than two because you cannot grow more than quadratically. And if it's one, it's the constant degree. It could be even like if the degree would be slowly decaying, it could be actually less than one, right? But you know, one would be linear growth, two would be quadratic growth, and in reality, we empirically observe is something in between. But it's non-trivial. It means it's greater than one. So um, that's the first uh, interesting empirical observation about these networks. So here's another another one that. Uh, is interesting, right? So we remember earlier in the like lecture number one, lecture number two, we talked about the random graph model, and we talked about what is the diameter of the random graph on n nodes, um, and we showed that the diameter of a random graph grows logarithmically with the size of the graph, right? Which uh, makes a lot of sense, right? If I have a graph on a few nodes, I have some diameter, and I take a bigger graph, the diameter will be bigger. Right? It's like if I take something, an object, and I measure how big it is, and now I take a bigger object, it will be bigger. So it should have bigger diameter. Right? Actually, what it turns out is that that's not the case. Okay? So this is kind of super uh, uh, counterintuitive. If you plot or if you measure the diameter over time, what you find is actually shrinking over time. Right? This is, again, the same uh, internet graph, and this is the citation network. And you see? how it's shrinking over time, okay? Now, of course, you will say, how exactly do you, uh, do you, uh, do you do this in practice? There are two things. One is that um, you would usually wouldn't take the diameter as the longest, shortest path, but you would take the average or something that is more robust. I think here we took the 90th percentile. And then what if the graph is disconnected? Many times you have a lot of small connected components, but they are small, so you just focus on the big one. And that's how you do this in practice, right? So what's the observation? The observation is that the diameter shrinks over time, right? So even though the network size doubles, the diameter goes you know, here from 4.8 to 4.6. And here, this is the archive citation network over, I think, like 16 years or more. Um, it goes from 10 down to about 5. Yes? Why don't we take the maximum diameter like the Oh, this is just how do I quantify diameter? And how do I operationally measure it? And the way the diameter is mathematically defined, it's the longest, shortest path. And the problem with that is that it's very um, fragile metric. You can have just something like sticking off, some tentacle sticking off, and it will totally throw you off. So you don't want to measure the maximum, but you want to measure something close to the maximum. So what you really do is you do something that is called effective diameter. And effective diameter is defined as the 90th percentile of the shortest path distribution. Right? So it's kind of it's kind of the maximum, but it's a bit less so that the outliers don't, don't make your metric too fragile. So that's that's the intuition. So here what I was measuring was the 90th percentile of average short of shortest path length distribution between pairs of nodes. All right? Yeah? Yes. All right. Great. So that was the idea. So now you can be like, wow, this is so cool. But you can say, huh, really, uh, Yure, you are silly. We all, of course we know why this is happening. So why should you be unimpressed? Great. Exactly. Right? So you should be, in some sense, you should say, like, of course, you, you, the number of edges is growing over time. And of course, whenever you throw in one more edge, you make the diameter a bit smaller, right? So what I showed you on the previous slide, 
may mean that the diameter is collapsing just because there's more edges and there's nothing. You just measured the same phenomenon twice, right? So the question now is, do I have two different phenomena or am I measuring the same phenomenon twice, right? The densification and this is just a, a consequence of densification. So here's one, one experiment that you can, that, that, uh, that we did that to show that densification is not enough. Okay, so here is, so you can ask, okay, how would I evaluate is densification enough? So here's the simplest way is to say, you know, is a uh, dia shrinking diameter just a consequence of densification, right? And I would, uh, the way we did it was to say, let's give an answer by simulation. So the idea was, let me generate random graphs um, that densify. So I will show you random graphs of different size and each, uh, uh, um, uh, each, gra each uh, random graph with n nodes will have n to the 1.5 edges or something like that, right? So it will densify, okay? Um, and let's measure uh, the diameter of it. Um, and if you do that, this is what you get, okay? So here, densification exponent that I was using to generate these graphs is 1.3. So my, gra my random graphs are getting denser. So if the densification would be the sole contributor to the shrinking diameter, then uh, I should see the thing going down. But I don't, right? So what do I conclude? I can conclude that densifying random graph has an increasing diameter. So this means that there is more to shrinking diameter than just the densification. Some, there must be some other ingredient because here, the densification itself is not enough, right? So there must be something else, all right? Yes? So if you get the same thing, but instead of getting rainy graphs, you generate basically power log graphs. Great okay. question. So that's exactly what I asked next, was like, is there something else that is special? So maybe Erdos Rainy is too naive. So let's say we would say, what if we generate random um, power log graphs that densify? OK, so uh, the way we, we asked the question was, what, I, what, like, what could explain is, is it the degree sequence that is changing over time, right? So it's not only the, the, the densification, but it's also how nodes gain degree as, the fa as uh, how they gain edges over time, OK? So how would you do this? The way you would do this is the following. You would say, let me take the real network and let me uh, uh, measure its diameter over time. And now let me take a random network that has the same degree distribution as the real one, right? So now I'm saying I will have a sequence of networks. They will get bigger. They, they will densify. And I will compare a real network to a random network that densifies and has the same degree, degree distribution, degree sequence, OK? Yes, yes, OK? So how, let's see how will this look like, right? And here is how it looks. Okay, so this is time. Now this is the archive paper, uh, the archive citation network. Red dots are diameters um, for uh, as a function of time, and then the blue dot is the uh, the blue line is the diameter of the network that has the same number of nodes, the same number of edges, and the same degree sequence as the red dot. And you basically see that the blue line follows the red dots, like super well. Okay. So what do, I, what do I learn from this? From this, I learned that densification plus the evolution of the degree distribution of the degree sequence leads to shrinking diameter. OK? You guys convinced? Yes? Are we saying the densification of it? Like, would just the degree sequence also do it? Great question. Would just the degree sequence do it? So that's what we'll ask next. All right, Any, anyone else, anything? All right, so let's now go, go and see what has happened to, to this guy, right? Like what is happening to the degree sequence? Can I, can I model it? So the question is, how does the degree sequence evolve to allow for densification? And there are two ways how the degree sequence can evolve. Um, the first thing I should say is that, ah, uh, yeah, what I should say is, Degree sequences are heavy tailed. They follow a power law degree distribution. And pa these power law distributions are funny because you can have a power law degree distribution or a power law distribution that has infinite expectation, which means you have a distribution when you ask what is the expected value, the expected value is infinite. 
Or another way to think of it, you have a degree, you have a distribution from which you sample data, and the more data points you sample, the higher the average will be. Okay? And what you can you can prove is that the that the degree distribution that has the exponent between one and two is a degree distribution with infinite expectation. And this means that that um, for these types of uh, um, degree distributions, the densification will be uh, 2 over gamma, where uh, gamma is the slope of the distribution and has to be between 1 and 2. OK? So what does this mean? This means that you can have a degree distribution that maintains its shape. But because it is so heavy tailed, as more nodes arrive, more heavy heater high degree nodes will come and that will push the total number of edges the sum of the degrees um, to to increase over time okay to show you uh, to show you an, uh, what uh, what does to show you or to say right so the consequence of this is that power loss with exponents less than 2 have uh, infinite expectations so by making a constant by maintaining a constant degree exponent alpha um, um, uh, or constant degree exponent, sorry, uh, gamma in our case, the average degree will grow. And to show you an example of this, here is a email network, degree distribution of the email network. It has this straight line shape. If you ask what is the slope of this line, it's 1.8. And this 1.8 is um, uh, maintained over time. But the network is still densifying because the 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 degree distribution um, is is very is very fat. There is kind of so much mass here in the tail is that uh, the high degree nodes keep increasing the average degree even though the shape of this remains constant over time. Yes. What is the topological interpretation of the degree exponent? So I mean, like we can see it's like the slope of this de degree distribution, but like what does this mean? Yeah. So this means is. This is the node degree, and this is the number of nodes of, of that degree, right? Aha, like <laughs> uh -huh. and gamma is the slope, uh, is the slope of this thing. And essentially, the way you can think of it, um, the 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 bigger the slope, the less mass you have in the tail. So the fewer outliers you have, and the lower, uh, the smaller the slope, right? Closer to one it gets, the more outliers you have here in the tail, right? Um, and, this, and these distributions are fundamentally different than this kind of exponential family distribution, Gaussians and so on, which if you would plot them on a, on a log log scale, they would kind of look like this. They would just finish, right? Uh, here, this thing has a lot of mass in the tail. So you have these basically super high degree nodes, and the most of the nodes have very low degree. Yes? Great. I'm, yes, I'm sorry. I did not. Um, it's a good, um, how to say, um, there are reasons uh, why this is the case. And maybe it's my mistake that I flipped the order of two lectures and I didn't really explain it. But the, the fact is, and uh, I am happy to point you to the place where this can be explained, is that basically for a power loss, uh, for these types of distributions that look like straight lines when plotted on logarithmic scales, their expectation will be infinite if the slope of this line is less than 2, or if it's between minus 1 and minus 2. And then if you make it, uh, uh, sorry, if you make it less than minus 2, so let's say minus 3, then the expectation is finite. It's a fact that you can, if you write down the power law distribution, uh, say, uh, compute the expectation as a function of uh, the exponent, then you find out that in this regime, the, the expectation, the first moment is infinite, but the second moment variance, uh, sorry, uh, is also infinite. For exponent between 2 and 3, the expectation, the first moment is finite, but the variance is infinite. And then, you know, between 3 and 4, the first two moments are finite, but the third moment is infinite. So this is how these uh, distributions uh, look like. I'm, yeah, I, I, it's a good point, and I'm, uh, I should have had a better explanation. Uh, and it turns out that many real world phenomena are distributed this way. If you look at um, wealth, 
wealth is distributed this way. If you look at number of people with a given surname, it's distributed this way. If you look at sizes of cities, it's distributed this way. If you are looking at the magnitude of earthquakes, it's like this. Right? So where, and this just means that extremes can be very, very big. Right? If you have infinite variance, this means uh, uh, a huge earthquake can strike at any point in time. Right? I'm not calling it, but that's the point. Right? All right. So thank you. Great questions. I'll provide more background uh, on this. OK? So that's the first thing is if you, these power laws are funny distributions. If you are in this range, your expectation will be infinite, so which means it will grow with the number of samples. And if you look at some network, uh, some, some types of networks, they actually maintain the same degree distribution, and they, uh, they densify because of the shape of the distribution. And then there is a second one that uh, the option two is that this uh, degree distribution evolves over time. One can derive how the degree distribution should evolve, but essentially this is the number of nodes. Um, and uh, x is the densification exponent. Uh, what you notice here um, is that um, um, is the following. For example, um, the way you can think of this to give you an example, here is a citation network that we were talking about before. It has kind of this type of uh, degree distribution. You can again estimate the, the exponent of this thing. And if you plot the exponent over time, the exponent is decreasing. So what this means is the distribution goes from, um, from something uh, um, very la very, very uh, with uh, non not, not too much fat tail to something that is less fat, right? And by kind of moving that way, it's pushing more, on, more and more of the, of the degrees towards higher degrees, and that's why it is densifying, right? So basically this is saying that the degree distribution is getting flatter over time. Right? The exponent is getting smaller. Yes? No? Is it clear what I'm trying to show here? So what I'm trying to show is I take multiple snapshots of the network. And for every snapshot, I ask, what is the slope of the degree distribution? And I'm showing that early on, the slope is, let's say, minus 3.5. Then it's minus 2.8, uh, minus 2.7, and so on. Right? This means that the degree goes from being very, um, very steep to getting shallower and shallower. Right? This is, uh, uh, at the end, y equals x to raised to the power of minus this. So the smaller it is, the shallower, uh, kind of the, the slower it decays. And because of that, the, the average uh, increases. Here is the average. Uh, here is the expected value of a power law distribution with a given exponent. It's um, uh, exponent minus 1 divided by exponent minus 2, right? So as the exponent uh, gets um, smaller, uh, the, the average will increase. Yes? I just uh, saw the answer to my question on the slide. So I was asking, it seems like it's converging towards an exponent of 2. Exactly. And then I saw that it's also on the slide. <laughs> exactly. If, if, exactly, right? If, as it's converging to the exponent of 2, it's basically converging to this infinite mean uh, regime. And then it will stay there. All right, good. So this is what I wanted to show you in terms of what is happening. So what is happening is networks are densifying and diameters are shrinking. And the reason for that is, um, is the way that the degree distribution is evolving over time. Either it's being basically having the, the distribution is um, constant, but has this uh, weird property that it's getting uh, denser because of the property of uh, power law uh, distribution, or the, or the exponent is evolving according to a given shape, um, and that gives us densification. So that's what I wanted to show. So now what I wanted to show is what would be a good model that would ge uh, generate these networks. Yes? I have a question. So does it mean that if the exponent is between 1 and 2, that it tends to not change over time? At least that's what we see empirically. Yes. Uh, it doesn't have to change. It will still densify. Yeah. All right. So here's the, uh, the model that allows you kind of to empirically generate networks with these types of properties. The model is called the forest fire model. And the idea is the following. Um, the, 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 the intuition for this model came from, the, um, from a, from a, from a uh, party. And the question is, how do you get introduced to new people at the party? Right? When I was a young student, 
uh, first time at, in US university, I needed to be introduced at parties. So I observed how that is done, right? And the way that is done is uh, the following, right? So um, you, how do you meet friends at the party, um, right? Or how do you identify references when writing papers? Uh, you know, here is you without any friends. So if everything goes well, you meet someone. Um, and what do they do? They uh, introduce you to their friends. Right, and then you make connections to them, and over time you will make more connections, and that's the idea for this uh, uh, forest fire model. Where idea is that the new node will come, it will somehow select the ambassador node, the W, and now we will try to basically, in some sense, start some kind of forest fire that will spread f over these edges, and wherever the fire will spread, we are going to create connections to those people, and as the fire spreads, this we will create connections to other people. OK, so the idea will be that somehow, now that we have selected the ambassador and kind of linked to the node, we will um, somehow decide which of the neighbors of W get, uh, get the fire. Um, and um, s maybe here the fire does not spread, but here we decide to spread it. So we will connect to this node as well. Um, then maybe here we again decide whether to spread the fire over these edges. Maybe decide to spread it here, so we'll create an edge. Decide to spread it here, create another edge. Uh, maybe we decide to spread it here as well, create another edge. And then you know keep deciding where to spread it or not until the fire dies. And this new node will link to everyone uh, who the fire uh, burned. OK? That's essentially the idea. It's a very simple iterative process, basically a network evolution process, where at every step node comes. Uh, selects an ambassador, we run this forest fire process, whoever gets burned, we create links to them. And then the new node arrives, and so on, right? So this is more like how do you identify references, right? You say, I want to write a paper, I find something similar, I see uh, who this uh, paper cites, I follow this reference, I decide now I'll cite this paper as well, I follow the references of this paper, and so on and so forth. And then when I'm like, uh, have too many references, I stop, right? And then the next paper comes. So that's uh, the intuition. So how exactly you do this is the following. You have two parameters. You have the what we call the forward burning probability and backward burning probability, because you can fo follow the references forward, or you can uh, y follow the references backward. This would be for directed networks, where the model operates the following. At each turn, a new node arrives. Um, uniformly at random, we choose this ambassador node W. And then we flip two coins, um, f uh, 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 sample from the geometric distribution of parameters with parameters uh, P and R that determine what number of in and out links of W we want to follow. And then we select that number of in and out links of W and spread the fire uh, along those links. And then the fire now spreads recursively to those nodes. To each node where the fire spreads, we again flip the two coins to know we, how many out links to follow, how many in links to follow. Um, and we continue this until the, the fire dies out. And then a new node V will link to all the burned nodes. Um, and that's how this model will work. OK? Um, that's the idea. Um, and as I, as, I, uh, as I showed before, um, here is uh, the simulation uh, of the model. Here are basically more details. But again, it's operating in iterations. At every iteration, a node will arrive, select the ambassador. And then here, we start this uh, recursive process where we determine how many outlinks, how many inlinks to burn, spread the fire along, this, uh, along these links. Um, and then continue the fire at the end points of those links. And we keep doing that until either we burned the entire graph or, um, or the process stops, which means that these coin flips would say, don't burn any links, or the node has no links, or something like that. OK? That's essentially uh, the idea. Um, the right how the wor works, V arrives, selects W, samples the, the uh, uh, in and out, number of in and out links. Then we select the, the two outgoing neighbors and one incoming neighbor. Let's call them this way. And now we repeat the same process independently for each of these nodes. And then whoever, whoever got burned, we create 
edges to them uh, from V. That's the idea. So now the question is, if you set some parameters, do you see densification? Here is the number of nodes as a function of time. Uh, here is the number of edges. And uh, here are dots are the, the, the graphs. And if you uh, plot this on logarithmic scales, fit a line, uh, you get a very nice uh, straight line here with the exponent of 3.2, uh, sorry, 1.3. And then if you also plot the diameter as a function of the number of nodes, again, you see how basically the diameter um, is shrinking. Yes? Connect with the inlinks of W. Like, uh, can't we just simulate the forest fire model with just connecting to the outlinks of W and then, uh, like, repeating the process for V for those? Uh -huh. So the reason why we you could also just do outgoing. We actually decide like, but the problem with doing the outgoing is that if you just do it down, then you are just creating a DAG. Right, you are always just kind of linking, linking just downstream, and we wanted to be able to link upstream as well. So that's why we have both processes: the the kind of the down, down, downstream fire, but also an upstream fire. That was the intuition why we why we decided to have both. Okay, so this is one example, um, and uh, you know, here is uh, another another thing: is does does the model also generate? Um, the realistic degree distribution. This is the in degree. That's the out degree. And again, you see how it follows a straight line when I plot it on uh, logarithmic scales. Yes. Uh, for the in degree distribution, you take both the parameters p and r. Like for the out degree distribution, there is only p. Uh, that's a matter of yes. So, like, why do you want to take the uh, parameter from the out degree distribution as well? Uh -huh. You you essentially need two parameters, and then the question is. How do you parameterize the thing? One way to parameterize is to say, I have two interesting things, two different things. Another way is to say, this, this is the base, and the other one multiplies it as, uh, as some kind of a factor. And at, its, at the end, it's the same. You could have two separate things, or you take one, and then for the other one, you take the first one and multiply it with the second one. It's just a different way to think about it. Okay, so by using one factor in both the things is common, you kind of regulating the effect of Exactly. Then you have a way to think about it. You say, aha, the forward burning is that. And now what fraction of the forward burning power is the backward burning power? Right? It kind of, it's easier to think about. That's the sole reason. Uh, good question. All right. Good. So we have this. We have that. Now, of course, you can ask, how, how big is the parameter region where I get this, this uh, notion of shrinking diameter and densification? And here is the computational experiment to do that. Right? Here is the forward burning probability. And here is a um, here's the value uh, of a of a given uh, uh, of a given statistic. Here we actually I think we we select the forward burning probability and then the backward burning probability is some function of this, some constant times this. And then uh, what? Uh, and here is you know we are burning very little. Here we are basically burning everything. Um, then um, the uh, this line, the dotted line, is the is the densification. When we are not burning anything, then essentially, if, if the forward burning is 0 and backward burning is 0, then we are just cre creating one, one link per node. So no densification. Okay? And then as we are uh, increasing this parameter, we, we, we need to increase it quite a bit. And then the densification happens. And then all, all of a sudden, it gets all the way kind of up to 2, which basically means that from then on, whenever a node comes, we just burn everyone. Right, and we are essentially creating a complete graph, so the, the average degree is increasing quadratically with the number of nodes. Okay, so for to get densification, we have a relatively um, narrow region of the parameter space where this happens, and then this is the diameter, um, where uh, the way the way to think of this is we we fit uh, we fit uh, some uh, some way to characterize whether the diameter is increasing or not. Um, and if it's above this line, the diameter is increasing. If it's below, it's decreasing. And again, you see that in this regime, when we get some interesting densification, also the diameter of the graph tends to decrease. Right Here, it's uh, slow, uh, slowly increasing. And then if it's uh, at 0, it means it's constant. And again, why is it constant here? Is because we are creating a complete graph. Right? Every node links to every other node. So diameter will be constant. It will be 1. Uh, we are creating a complete graph. So everything from here on makes total sense. 
Here, we are essentially creating a tree, so the diameter is increasing over time, right? Um, and here is this narrow region where we have both some den uh, we have densification and shrinking diameter, right? So there is some relatively narrow parameter region where this happens. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show about the macroscopic part. Um, are there any questions? Yes? So back to the last slide. Why does the diameter increase when um, the forward burning probability is like going from 0 to 0.4? So why is the diameter increasing here? Because if the burning probability is small, then just think of this endpoint here. This means that whenever a node arrives, it uh, selects an ambassador, but then no fire happens. So this means essentially I'm creating this tree where every node has one edge, one outgoing edge, right? So the diameter will be increasing because I'm just creating a tree. Uh, and it won't densify because every node has exactly one outgoing edge, right? And then here, diameter is constant because I'm creating a complete graph. So, every, so everyone's connected to everyone. The densification is maximum. And, uh, right? and you know, the reason why does it go above 2 there a bit is just for the empirical reasons. Right? Because, I don't know, imperfect fitting or whatever you want to call it. All right? Good question. Great. So let us continue. So now I want to talk about uh, this notion of temporal networks and then tell you about some measures of nodes of no, uh, basically give you a generalization of page rank to temp uh, to dynamic networks. So here's the idea how we'll now think of this. So, so far at the macroscopic level, we only looked at this kind of snapshot. We said for every day, for every month, for every year, let's create a snapshot of the network. What we will do now is we'll say, can we do, can we be more faithful to how nodes and uh, edges are coming and, and leaving? So we'll dis define this notion of temporal networks, where a temporal network is a sequence of static um, uh, graphs over the same set of nodes. And each temporal edge has a timestamp, uh, is a timestamped order, uh, uh, timestamped ordered uh, pairs of nodes. So I know node, node, time, where uh, ti is the time step at, uh, time stamp at which the node exists, right? So the way I could think of this is if I have the network, you know, this edge AC uh, uh, existed at time two, uh, CD existed at times one, two, and three, uh, CE only existed at time one and existed at time three, but at time two, it wasn't here. That's uh, what we would like to capture. And these edges we will call temporal edges because they can exist or not exist, okay? Um, and now we can think of uh, temporal networks as a, as a sequence of static, direct, uh, static graphs where every graph has the same uh, set of nodes and then the edges change, right? So what I'm trying to say is that this graph here on the top if I, if I create a temporal network out of it, one representation would be that now I have three snapshots of the same network, but edges uh, change between, uh, between different snapshots. Again, for example, edge uh, CD is here all the time. Uh, CE should be here at time one, not here at time two, but again here at time three, right? So that's one way to think about it. That's um, another way to think about it. I'm just trying to give you some intuition how to, how to define these things and how to think about them. Uh, what would be examples of these types of temporal networks? You can think of communication networks like email, phone, co phone calls, face-to-face. -face. You can think about creating proximity networks, which is who is physically close to whom. These types of networks are very important for disease transmission. Right? So you could think about how are people in the same hospital rooms? Do they meet at conferences? Uh, you know, do you have animals uh, meeting each other in the forest and so on? You can think of this also as transportation network where uh, in transportation networks where, where trains or pl planes fly um, and also in, um, in, uh, in biology. This is a communication network uh, over, over different days I think it's uh, um, at a given um, um, uh, at a given. I think it's at, at, a, at a university somewhere on the east coast, where you basically have a set of nodes and you see the communication between them. And you see that there is a lot of communication on Monday, maybe even a bit more on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday quite a bit, Saturday and Sunday people don't do email, right? Um, just if you plot that out. Um, 
another another example is uh, this is uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, two two different uh, networks uh, um, of uh, people's uh, um, uh, uh, physical uh, physical proximity where uh, these are the time slots I think when people were let in and this is now on two different days um, and you can see how essentially this network is kind of is uh, time ordered right is who's hanging who's hanging with whom and here is the this this uh, 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 edges show the, the show kind of this is the this is the the longest path in the network that defines the diameter and I think they just visualized it to try to show what's kind of the backbone uh, of the network but that's another way to think about this so now that we have this notion of temporal networks that I just defined and showed you kind of two examples of them we can now start thinking about how do networks evolve at this microscopic level? How do the nodes change uh, over time? So what are we interested in? What are some kind of local node-specific phenomena uh, in the networks as networks evolve? So what we will talk about is how do we define paths and walks on temporal networks? And how can we then extend, for example, the notion of page rank or some kind of node importance to temporal graphs? So that's the second topic I want to talk about, OK? So now we need to define basically this notion of walks and paths that we defined on simple graphs and extend them to um, temporal graphs. So the way I, I'll say a temporal path is simply a sequence of uh, edges so that uh, edges obey time, right? Like whenever I cross an edge, the next edge I cross should happen after the, the edge I traversed. And that's essentially it, right? So if I have now this temporal network here, then, for example, uh, a sequence of edges uh, 5, 2, 2, two, uh, two 1, um, uh, together with a sequence of times would be a temporal path, right? Why? Because I go from 5 to 2 here, and then I do nothing at time 2, but um, at time 3, I can go to 2 to 1. So this is a valid temporal path, right? So. 5, 2, 2, 1 is a valid temporal path because I go from 5 to 2 at time 1. Now I wait two steps at uh, two time points at uh, position 2, and then I go from 2 to 1, and I completed the path. OK? Um, so this is now a valid temporal path. No notice that when I come into the node, I can wait there as long as I want. I don't have to move in the next time. I can wait there. That's why. Um, this is interesting. So now, the first thing you can then define is this notion of temporal shortest paths. And the way you do temporal shortest paths is um, to, uh, to basically generalize Dijk Dijkstra's algorithm. And all you are doing is to say, when you come to the node, you can only go outside, out of the node by the edges that happened after you came in. So I show you um, a lot of uh, pseudocode here. This is just a, a shortest path algorithm, but the, um, the, way, the way to think of this is that basically uh, the, on, the, on the input, I will get the source node, I'll get the target node, I'll have the time at which the query starts. So the time at which I, let's say, want to start at the starting node. Um, and uh, now I want to calculate the, the distance, um, the shortest temporal path that connects NT, NS to NT. Um, and essentially, the way the way we really the way we want to think of this is um, to uh, to have this um, this uh, iteration. Here we are setting the distance to all the nodes to be infinite. Here is where we uh, start the walk, uh, start the path. We start we insert the uh, the starting node into the priority queue, and then until the priority queue is empty, we iterate. But essentially, what we are doing is to say out of the priority queue, get me the node that has the, the, the shortest, uh, uh, the shortest um, uh, distance. If, the, if, the, if that node is the target node, then return and return me the distance. Otherwise, let's go over all the neighbors V of this current node U. And uh, here is what we, are, uh, what, we are, uh, what we are doing. What we are doing is to say, uh -huh, the, the time um, um, at, uh, uh, the, the start time of the edge sh has to be uh, less than Q sub T, and Q sub T has to be less than time, the end time of the edge, um, and the distance to U 
plus the, the, the weight or the length of the edge we are currently considering E has to be, has to be less than what was the shortest path to that node V so far. And that's the if that's the case, we update the distance and then we insert um, the V and the distance into the, into the priority queue and so on. The only thing that is different here from the traditional shortest path algorithm is, is this part where we are basically checking the time of the, of, um, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the starting time of the edge and the end time of the edge and say, is my query time, is this uh, inside that um, interval? And the rest, the rest is kind of standard uh, um, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. I want to show you an example of how this looks like. Imagine I have a sequence, so basically I have a graph that evolves over time. Here it is at uh, uh, five different time points, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and uh, what I'm uh, interested in is the shortest path between uh, A and F. Um, and uh, at time one, the shortest path is this. Um, for example, at time two, the red edges are the shortest path, right? because the length is uh, 50, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, at time two, uh, I misspoke, the red edges are the ones that appear and the shortest path is now that, right? So three plus three is less than seven and uh, eight is less than four plus six. So that's now, so the shortest path is A, C, D, F. Then at next time step, let's say these two more edges appear so now the, the shortest path is here, here, and then up and down. Um, at the next time step, let's say assume this edge seven di disappeared, but these two new other edges were added. So now the shortest path goes up here and its length is 12. Um, you know, at this next time stamp, uh, the weight of this edge changed, uh, but, the, re but the, the shortest path will stay the same, right? And the algorithm we have there will basically allow us to identify shortest paths and how they move um, as the network structure evolves. Yes? So are we running this for the entire like, set of graphs, or are we running it for every? Uh, we, we would run it <coughs> for a given uh, query time. We are running it only for a given query time, right? We want to say, what's the shortest path in the network at this given time, right? And that's here I'm saying, if this is the query time, the edge has to be valid, right? The starting time of the edge and end time of the edge has to be in between the query time, right? So I'm basically saying, what's the shortest path at a given time? So the query is source, destination, and the time. Great, actually, thank you for asking this. Yes? So the query time is a point, not an interval. The query time is a point, it's not an interval. So running this with t equals four, that's the path I get. The running this at t equals three, this will be the path I get. So one option, one option would be that you have the temporal network represented as um, uh, as a as a graph where um, every every edge has a time a starting time and end time. This, in principle, could be something more complex. If you have now several little intervals when a given edge was uh, active. Uh, another option would be to say, let me first just materialize the graph of how the, of all the alive edges at a given time, and then run simple Dijkstra. And here we are trying to do both, uh, we are doing the two things at the same time, which means we don't have to rerun Dijkstra. Uh, sorry, we don't have to materialize the graph, right? So we save uh, materializing the graph. So that's the first uh, thing I wanted to show. And why did I wanna show you this? Uh, uh, shortest path algorithm because there is this notion of closeness centrality. And closeness centrality is a measure how close is a node to any other node in the network, right? So if you are very central, then you have short paths to everyone else in the network. And if you are non-central, if you are on the periphery, you have long paths to everyone else in the network. So the notion of uh, um, closeness centrality tells you whether the node is kind of in the middle or is on the edge, right? So now we are defining this notion of closeness centrality for a given node X at a given time to be simply um, the, uh, the, uh, the sum, one over the sum of the shortest path lengths between the node X and every other node Y 
at a given time t, right? So this basically means, um, uh, and now I can define this as a time series as I can change t, right? And this will tell me how the closeness centrality of a given node is changing over time, right? So for example, here, if I ask what's the closeness centrality of node A at time <laughs> 2, um, then I would basically a ask what is the shortest path distance between node A and any other node in the graph at time 2. Here are, uh, here are the distances. Um, I would sum them up, do one over that, and this would be the, uh, the closeness centrality. And the way I, uh, I why did I did it, why did I do it um, this way is because um, hi, um, uh, higher is better, right? So higher centrality, higher value of centrality means you are more central, right? So you have shortest, shorter paths to everyone else, okay? That's essentially the idea. So I can use the algorithm on the previous slide and, uh, and uh, now do this calculation. I could do it over all the nodes. I could select a subset, a random set of nodes um, and run this. Um, then, of course, what's kind of the, the, the thing you also would have to uh, worry, uh, worry in, the, in, the, in practice um, would be the following. Um, for example, uh, here, if I'm at time 2, then the distance to node uh, uh, B should be um, uh -huh, interesting. So the, que right, the question will be, what happens to the, to, the, to the shortest path if I cannot reach a given node? And what you could do is use some large constant or something to put in here to, uh, to account for that. I think that's what they do. OK, so that's notion of temporal closeness centrality. So now you are able to track the importance of the node as a, as a function of time. Yes? Doesn't this become like computationally very expensive? That's a great point. So you are saying um, it is expensive because you have to do kind of all pairs, shortest paths over all times. Yes. Um, correct. How could you do it is that you'd approximate this using some kind of random sampling. That would be a way to approximate it. Uh, good point. Uh, great. OK. So that's one. So now uh, what I would like to do um, uh, uh, to, to, um, uh, next is to talk about generalization of page rank. Right? So the idea now will be the following. Imagine again I have some uh, temporal network. Then, for example, what I'd like to do is I'd like to model how does, what is, how does the page rank of a given node uh, change over time, right? And for example, if now here I'm looking at node A uh, here in the center, you can see how early on node A receives a lot of edges. It gets one at time one and two and three and five and six. But then, but then at the, at the second part of time, you know, 10, 11, 12, it doesn't get any edges, right? So the observation would be that A initially receives many inlinks, um, and thus it should be considered important early on. But after some time, it does not receive any inlinks. So, so that means kind of its importance should diminish, um, uh, should diminish over time. So with this, um, let's see if we can generalize uh, page rank to this setting. OK, so now what I want to do is, uh, as I was saying before, we had a notion of, the pa of a path. Now let's define a notion of a walk. A temporal walk is a sequence of edges such that the times, uh, again, when we traverse the edge um, are uh, time obeying. So for example, you know, 5, 2, uh, two, uh, two 1, uh, 1, 5 is a, is, a valid, is a valid walk because, again, I'm traversing edges one uh, after the other, meaning that the, edge, that the times when I traverse the edges are non-decreasing or are, um, in, uh, are increasing, right? Um, notice the way we defined it that you could do one, two, uh, four, f uh, two, four in this step, and then in next step you could, I don't know, uh, wait, wait till here and do uh, four, one, one, two. That would be still fine because the, uh, you can traverse multiple edges in the same in the same time step given the definition okay so that's the notion of uh, of uh, temporal walk so now we we want to define a random walk on a temporal uh, time respecting uh, graph right and uh, again the idea is that the time steps 
timestamps needs to increase along the path, right? So uh, an example of uh, from uh, 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 C uh, to B to um, A and back to C is a, is a, is a time-respecting walk because I traverse this at 2, then at 7, then at 9. But for example, from A to C, I can only move at 9. But then from C to, to B, I would have to move at time 2. So this is not time-respecting because I arrived to, to C at time 9 and uh, the edge 2 has already kind of uh, happened. So this would be a non-time-respecting uh, walk. Here I'm making a, an assumption that the edge is alive only for one time unit, right? I'm kind of taking the interval and simplifying it to be, you know, this is alive between 10 and 11, and the next one is alive between 11 and 12, and so on, OK? Um, now that we have that, we can now start thinking about what are the probabilities of temporal paths. And what I'll do next is kind of I'll um, introduce quite a bit of uh, notation and thinking how to properly define this. But when we are going to compute this, we will use a very, we will use a different algorithm that will be simpler and won't be so computationally uh, intensive than basically trying to implement this the way I will explain it. So kind of bear with me, and then we'll talk about the method, right? Um, the way we can think of this is we, what we want to do is we want to calculate the probability of a temporal path, right? So we want to say that um, we want to ask, you know, what's the probability of me going from u to x at time 2 given that I, okay, that I went from v to u at time t1, right? And uh, my goal would be here to model this notion that, that, the, that the probability of transition should, should, uh, uh, should decrease as the difference uh, increases. Right? The bigger the time delta, the less likely I am to kind of take that, that step. So um, the way uh, people model this is to say um, the, the transition probability from, from going uh, from when I arrive to u at t1, and now I want to go from uh, u uh, to uh, x uh, via uh, at time t2 should be uh, beta raised to some um, uh, 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 power uh, gamma, where beta will be between 0 and 1. So with increasing gamma, this will get smaller. And then how is the gamma defined? Gamma, gamma defined is defined as a set of all temporal edges from u during this interval t1 to t2. OK? So I'm basically saying um, the, the gamma is the number of edges I, I, I was able to, I, or that I could have picked uh, between the time I came in and the time I left, right? And the longer I have to wait, the bigger this number of possible edges will be, so the lower that transition probability will be, right? It's essentially saying there were all these kind of trains that went by and I was waiting for the right train, and the longer I wait, the, the less likely I am to take the one that came. Yes? Well, I'm a little confused. What's the difference between temporal path and Aha, uh -huh, great question. What's the difference between path and a walk? Uh, a path is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, in a path, you cannot visit the same node uh, again. On a walk, you can do, you, you can be drunk and it's kind of fine. Right? But in a path, you, you are sober, so you don't, you don't go back. You don't return to where you started or whatever. So walk is a, is a walk. Path is the nodes don't repeat. All okay? right? Um, Great. So this is, uh, uh, this is how we can think about these transitions, right? And the idea is, right, that the smaller values of beta increase the probability of walk stopping um, at, hi at high degree nodes. Um, and, right, because the, the smaller the beta will be, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the faster this, uh, uh, the, the decay will be. Right? So the, the less likely we are to take, the, to take the edge, or the less likely we are to wait very long. And if beta would equal, for example, 1, then the, we, would be able, we would be willing to take any edge out of that node. Right? While if the beta is small, this means the probability of taking the edge will decrease a lot as, long, as, as we stay, stay longer. So the, the random walk will just wait at that given node and won't take the transition. So this is. Uh, the notion of a transition probability and how it depends on time. And it will depend on time based on the number of edges that we could have taken, but we did not. 
So now uh, here is the, the intuition, right? The intuition is that um, as time will go to infinity, the question is uh, what, we, what will happen to this temporal page rank? And the temporal page rank will converge to the static notion of uh, page rank. Meaning if you are able to use all the edges, then you will converge to the, you will basically compute the static version of the page rank, right? So, so the way to think of this is that temporal page rank will be like running a real page rank on a time augmented graph. And I will define this in the next slide where basically we will connect graphs at different time steps um, via what we will call time hops um, and run page rank on this time extended graph, right? So node u at time one will become, will become uh, a node that is defined by node and time in this new graph. Um, and the transition probabilities will be defined as I said before, right? So you will, you will traverse from node u at time one to node x at time, time two given that you came to node v uh, um, at, uh, that you went from node v at some time to node u at, at the next time based on this beta to the delta that we defined, okay? So uh, this is a complex way of essentially of saying that I arrived at node u at time one and now I will exit node u at time t2, okay? Um, you will see why I write these things in this funny way. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the way you can think of this is the following, right? If I have my uh, snapshot of graphs, what I will do is I will connect the same nodes uh, temporally, right? So I will connect uh, a, um, I will connect a, a to B. I will connect, for example, uh, a to C here, and I will then connect A to B uh, here, right? Because uh, what the, why, why do I do that? Um, because the node, node A had, for example, link to node B at time one, had a link to node C at time two, and uh, it had a link to node B at time three, right? So now for every time comma node, I create a new node, and now I can, Rather than thinking of these links appearing here, I can think of them as appearing between the node and the, and the target, right? So this is how the how the um, the links will look like, right? And I can now do, now do this uh, for all for all the nodes to create this kind of temporally augmented network. Um, is uh, is this clear? People see what I do, right? So essentially now this will be my full network, right? So rather than having, so I will have every node replicated as many times as, the, as there are time steps. And then uh, edge will be simply the edge that uh, survives between on a given interval will basically mean that nodes on those intervals link to each other, okay? That's the, that is the idea. Um, and now uh, um, this is how we will, thi uh, we will think about this, right? And, and again, as I said before, for example, this edge will be here because this edge is alive here. But for example, the edge between uh, E and C is alive also at time three. So it means that E will link to C at time three. So E at time one links to C at uh, time three. Um, and now we can, we can repeat this process to create this type of, type of temporally augmented graph across all nodes and across all time steps, right? And now if I would run um, the page rank on this temporally augmented graph, then now I would get a different importance, let's say for node C at time one versus time two versus time three, right? Um, and this is essentially um, how, this would, uh, how this would work um, at least conceptually. Um, do people have any questions? Right, so what we did, yes, what we did um, um, is we took the temporal graph and now we created kind of a bigger network where we replicated our temporal graph as, as, as many times as there are timestamps. And then rather than saying an edge is alive um, in a given timestamp, we actually connected nodes across different timestamps. And this means that now we connected these temporal graphs uh, this way as well. Yes? Are you saying that there's 
edges are directed or undirected? Uh -huh. um, are we assuming that the edges are undirected or directed? The way I'm doing it here, I am, um, I, I wanna, so the cross time edges are directed. Uh, the reason why is that is, of course, I would make a, uh, an edge uh, from E to C, and then I would also make an edge from C uh, to E, right? But I want these edges to be directed because of time respecting walks, right? If you think about page rank, I only wanna go here. I cannot go back into the past. So these edges that go across time has to be only forward pointing, right? That's essential, yes? Time augmentation also make it possible to include nodes that haven't been around for all time periods. Um, because I know that was like the original constraint was that we said the nodes have to be around for all time periods. Yeah. Um, but that was because in like the non-augmented form, if you have a node there, it suggests that it was there. And if you don't have a node, it doesn't mean anything. But now you could include like a node that doesn't have versions of itself for time one. Like no. it could just appear at like time three or something. So for example, right? This guy for all intents and purposes that no, does not exist here. Yeah, right. So yes, you can have nodes coming and going. And essentially, the way you can think of them as isolated nodes that are around all the time, and you ignore them. Right, that's, a, that's an excellent point. All right. Uh, anything else? Yes? Like how it, as t tends to infinity, how does it converge to a static page? Uh, yes. Um, where is the, where did you see the claim? Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. um, the, let's see. Aha, uh -huh. this claim. Aha, uh -huh. so what this claim is um, trying to do is the following. I think what this is trying to say, um, as if you, if you um, push the, as you unroll the time, um, the assumption here is that edges are arriving, but edges are never leaving. So what this is trying to say is that if you have the graph that only will grow, and if you think of this as temporal uh, walk, then as these new edges will arrive, your, your final page rank distribution will essentially become the, the distribution on, uh, will become page rank on the final graph. So the way you think about this is as as imagine no edges ever leave. So as you will start the random walk and you will keep iterating it here, the random walker will kind of be stuck here at the end, right? Because it can only make time forward and then it gets stuck here, right? So w at the end, these guys, the, the page rank scores of the nodes here will be the final page rank scores. Does it make sense what I'm trying to say? To go till in, like, uh, no, uh, what do we, I mean? Sorry, uh, till infinity just means to the end, whatever is the end, the last step. Infinity means last step. Yes, that's a good, that's a good point, right? So this is what I wanted to show you, and I want to show you just one um, experimental result. Uh, so, for example, here is an experimental result. What these people did is they said, let's uh, let's have this temporal notion of of page rank. Let's uh, uh, create this sample of uh, 10,000 uh, uh, temporal edges and then uh, create another sample of 10,000 uh, temporal edges and another sample of 10,000 10, te temporal edges. And then let's uh, keep adding these temporal edges in one after another. And uh, let's measure how do the page rank scores converge to the, to the final graph that is here. And then the way you can think of this is these edges are coming in, and here is the final kind of static graph. And uh, what is this showing is how is this correlating, or how does this relate to the final page rank scores of the static graph? And what this is trying to say is that as you see very few edges, the scores are not so related with the final scores. But as you get to see more edges, they basically converge to the final page rank values. And now you rewire the graph, you throw all the edges away, and you are now throwing in another set of edges. And again, as you throw in more and more edges, the scores converge to the final static graph you have at the end. And then you kind of reset the graph and so on, right? So this is 
to validate this claim that as, the temp as you get to see more edges, as the edges are being added to the temporal graph, then the scores are kind of smoothly approaching the final static graph scores, right? Um, this is in the case, this is just trying to say that um, as more edges are revealed, essentially this walk over the augmented graph converges to the, at the last step is the page rank on the final static graph, right? But in between, um, you get interesting behavior. And now you can, of course, trace the page rank score of individual nodes as the time goes on. So let me finish here. Um, thank you, thank you very much for all the questions. I thought it was, uh, they were super good. It was super useful and super helpful. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next week.